All right, hi everyone. Thank you for joining the Pennsylvania Game Commission for the first part of our three part Learn to Hunt Waterfowl series. Um, before we get started, I would just like to let everybody know that we are recording um, this webinar today. Um, so just so you know, we are recording. Um, this is so that we can actually be able to provide this recording to registrants later in our follow up email. My name is Courtney Lasavita, and I am the Hunter Education Outreach Division Chief for the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and I will be moderating today's program. Um, today, our Learn to Hunt program will specifically focus on providing you with the knowledge needed to get started hunting Canada geese this fall. Just as a friendly reminder, uh, reminder Pennsylvania's Canada goose season opens statewide on September 1st, 2023. Um, before we get started, I would like to take care of some housekeeping items. First, can everyone hear me? So if you can hear me, um, please let me know by either giving me a thumbs up emoji or by typing it in the chat. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up, so that is good. Okay. Um, if you are having trouble hearing me, um, I might have to type this in the chat because if you can't hear me, that's a problem, huh? Um, <laughs> if you are having a problem, um, please consider um, logging off and rejoining the webinar, or you can always call via phone for audio. I put the number and the pin in the chat, okay? Um, the presentation will take approximately 45 minutes to complete and will be followed by a short Q&A session. If you have um, questions at any point during the presentation, you can ask them through the chat and we will do our best to answer them um, at the end. We do have over 100 people, 180 people registered for this event today, so we may not be able to get to everyone's questions. Um, if we do not get to your question, we will follow up with you via email afterwards. OK, so let's get started. Um, I would like to introduce Ken Duran, who is our Game Bird Supervisor for the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and he is going to discuss biology, habitat preferences of Canada geese, as well as an overview of regulations. Right, thanks, Courtney, and thank you all for joining us today to uh, learn about hunting geese in Pennsylvania. Uh, as Courtney said, um, I lead a team of biologists that oversee monitoring and setting regulations for all of our game birds in the state. Uh, and then I'm also usually led in the field by my dog, Jersey, which you see on the screen. Uh, to start out, we're going to talk about Canada geese biology. And in Pennsylvania, we have two populations of geese that uh, we were really dealing with. The first is uh, more common and what people are familiar with, our resident population. These are geese that spend all of their time in Pennsylvania. We have about 130,000 breeding pairs of resident Canada geese in the state. Our other population are birds that overwinter here in Pennsylvania, but migrate up to northern Canada. About 1,200 miles straight north of Pennsylvania is where they breed and spend their summer. There's about 150,000 breeding pairs of migrating Canada geese in that population that then do come in over winter in Pennsylvania and other nearby states. Both of these populations look very similar. Our resident populations are slightly bigger geese um, coming in at, uh, typically over 12 pounds, where our migrant geese are typically a little less than 12 pounds. There's a lot of overlap, so size alone can't isn't really going to be able to tell you if you harvest or seeing resident or migrant bird. Male and female Canada geese look similar. Uh, males tend to be slightly larger, but uh, there is a lot of uh, overlap in sizes again. So you really can't tell the difference um, easily whether you have a male or a female Canada goose. Um, for hunting, uh, habitat wise for Canada geese, we're really kind of thinking about two sites, our roost sites, these are places where Canada geese spend a lot of time um, away from predators. They're not doing a lot. They're resting. They're sl swimming around a little bit. Uh, they'll spend a lot of their time in day during the day at roost site and then all of the evening at, at these roost sites. In the mornings, 
Uh, they'll wake up and fly out of their roost sites looking for food. Geese eat a lot of grains and green vegetation like grasses. So depending on the time of year and the temperature, you're going to be looking for uh, waste grain fields such as corn or uh, cut hay fields and sometimes in areas with wetlands where there's a little bit of vegetation growing in the water, they may feed in those. But most of the hunting that you're going to be looking for are those grain fields and hay fields. Especially when it gets colder, they're going to be looking for higher energy foods like corn. Uh, so you may find them more in those grain fields when it's cold in, during winter. Geese are fairly easy to identify. They are large birds with a long black neck and a brown body. Um, from a distance, geese are going to be bigger than ducks, but you can really tell the difference between a flock of geese and ducks by looking at their wings and how fast they're moving. Geese are going to have larger wings compared to their bodies than ducks, which have tiny wings compared to body size. And ducks flap their wings really fast, uh, whereas geese are, are flapping a, a little bit slower. Now, once you get cl geese in close and within shooting distance, they're very unique. You not really have to concern about uh, misidentifying them. But the, the big characteristic is look for the white chin strap that you see on those photos. That's a really strong characteristic of geese that you're not really going to see in other birds. Uh, so in terms of ID, they're pretty easy to identify for new hunters. Uh, you don't need to be um, too concerned about mistaking them for another species. Now let's talk about regulations. I'm going to give kind of the high points of regulations, talk about the main certain main aspects of it, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. I encourage you to look at our hunting and trapping digest um, after this if you have more questions that we can't answer today. And just even myself as a longtime hunter and somebody who helps influence the regulations, I refer back to our hunting and trapping digest frequently just to make sure if I have a question that I um, am positive that I know the regulations correctly. So please remember to always refer back to our hunting and trapping digest. So getting into what's required to hunt geese, we're going to start with our general hunting license. Everybody is required to have that. Uh, you also need a state migratory game bird license. And when you get this migratory game bird license, they're going to ask you a series of questions about how much you spend, about which species you hunt and how many you harvested. This is really important information for us to figure out what our migratory game bird hunters are pursuing and how much harvest we are getting, and that helps go into setting regulations. If you're buying your game bird license in a store, please make sure that the, the person working the register is asking you those questions. And then the last license you need to hunt geese is the federal duck stamp. If you buy online, you're gonna get uh, an electronic duck stamp that you can use immediately and your um, physical duck stamp is going to be shipped in the mail. When you receive that in the mail, then you can make sure you take that out hunting with you. But until you have it in the mail, you can use your electronic duck stamp. Moving on to arms and ammunitions, uh, we're going to be using manual and semiotic shotguns uh, that are 10 gauge or less. Those are the legal arms for uh, hunting geese. Some really important things about shotguns is that you can only have three shells max in the shotgun. So that's one in the chamber and two in the magazine. Most shotguns um, can have more, can fit more than two shells in the magazine. So you need to make sure you put a plug in that magazine. This can be as simple as a wooden dowel cut to the right size, or you can buy um, commercially made ones from most and find them in most sporting goods stores. If you get uh, checked by a warden in the field, they're probably going to be making sure that you can't fit more than two shells in that magazine. Uh, that is something they will often check up with waterfowl hunters. And then in terms of the types of shotgun shells you're using, just make sure it's not lead shot. That is illegal to use and it must be uh, size T or less. We'll move now to our seasons. We have two seasons for hunting Canada geese in Pennsylvania and two zones that you need to pay attention to. The first season, met Courtney already mentioned, it opens on September 1st. That's our, uh, and it runs through September 25th. 
this is a statewide season. You have during that season, you can harvest eight birds uh, every day. And the hunting hours begin a half an hour before sunrise and run to a half an hour after sunset. This season, uh, we have such a high daily limit because uh, we're harvesting only the, our resident population geese at, because at this point, our migrants are not in the state during, during September. And this is an important season to help prevent our resident population from becoming too big and causing lots of nuisance problems. Uh, next season is our regular season, and that the season dates are going to vary by the zone or where you at and where you are at in the state. So if you look on the map on the screen, the blue area is our resident population zone. This is the areas of the state where we primarily just have resident population geese. The season um, runs from October 28th through November 24th, December 11th through January 20th, and February 2nd through February 24th. And you can harvest five geese per day during that season. The other zone that we have is the Atlantic population zone. This is the area of the state where those migratory geese overwinter um, in Pennsylvania. And the migratory geese can't um, their populations can't sustain a, as high a level of harvest, so we have more limited seasons there. The daily bag limit during the regular season is three, and the season runs from November 18th through the 24th and December 7th through January 20th. Uh, if you look at this map, you see two gray areas up in the northwest and one in the southeast. These are special areas uh, with their own season uh, bag limits and dates. Again, please refer to your hunting digest to get more details on hunting in those areas. And that is all I have for our regulations. Now I'm going to turn it over to our experienced goose hunter to talk to you about how to actually hunt these birds. Hi, my name's uh, John Fultovic. I am a videographer editor with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And uh, I've been waterfowl hunting for um, almost a little over 20 years. Um, I'm fortunate that my career has taken me all over the world to, to chase waterfowl all over the place. Um, and as you can see on the screen, that's my that's my good buddy and uh, my retriever there on the screen. Uh, my seven-year-old yellow lab. His name's Rook. So we will get started here um tips into getting started um so something i would recommend for people who are looking to get into this is is finding people in your area that are avid waterfowl hunters to begin with and getting with them and trying to learn from them and developing those relationships in your area um patterning your gun is big to do before the season starts. That way you know the lethal range of your firearm before you go out and start hunting. Um, some of the legal uh, legal methods that I would like to go over too for, for this is um, you can decoy birds. Um, that's a big part um, of hunting for Canada geese. You can pass shoot and jump shooting is uh, legal methods of hunting for these birds. Now, in saying that, I would like to say that you need to do your homework when you're pass shooting and jump shooting, and I recommend not to do those things um, on public land, um, especially for safety reasons. You need to make sure that you're being safe when you do those things. Um, scout the area ahead of, ahead of time and make sure you know what's in the area, where your safety zones are, and everything like that so that you're being as safe as possible um, when practicing these um, methods of hunting. Um, so scouting a lot. Scouting is something that is huge um, in waterfowl hunting in general. Um, and the more time you spend doing that, the more successful you are definitely going to be um, down the road. And as the season goes on, you'll be able to start to see tendencies in birds um, and how they change as the year goes on. And when you're on 
public game lands and even private land too. You want to be respectful to the landowners and respectful to other hunters that are in your area or that are hunting on the same public lands that you are on. Um, you know, give give enough distance in between setups if you guys are set up near each other. You guys don't want to be battling with each other while you're hunting on public land. That just gives a lot more a, a lower stress level to to you and a lower stress level to the birds that are on that area as well. Um, equipment to use to get started. Um, kind of went over this a little bit already with um, the shotguns and the non-toxic shot. Um, no lead shot. Um, so I'm going to move to blinds. Um, you can uh, some blinds that you could definitely use and that are um, easy to obtain. They're out there. They're all over the place. There's a lot of companies that make some some great blinds, especially panel blinds, if you want to go that route. Um, panel blinds are super, super comfortable. You can fit usually between three and four people behind a panel blind. Um, and then you can use layout blinds, which get you out into the middle of the fields, um, right where the birds usually like to be. Um, and then you can kind of get right in their wheelhouse when they're trying to be in a certain spot in the field. Um, and mobile chairs are good, for, especially for when you're hunting out of panel blinds, just to keep you more comfortable um, and gives you a more stable platform to shoot from too when you stand up out of a chair versus when you may sit up out of a layup line. Some equipment that uh, I would like to talk about. So decoys, so there's multiple types of decoys that you can use when you go out hunting for geese. Um, you can use full body, full body decoys. Now these are a little bit more expensive than some other types of decoys to take up a little bit more room, um, but they give a much more lifelike appearance when you're out hunting these birds and their geese will be much more susceptible to coming in um, if, when you have full bodies out possibly versus um, other types of decoys. Now on the, other, on the screen, you'll see silhouette decoys as well. There's a lot of brands out there with sil that make silhouette decoys and they've kind of taken over the market um, in the recent years and they've become a very 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 good type of decoy to use throughout the season no matter when what time of year it is um, and they, te they tend to be a lot cheaper um, you can pack them in a lot uh, easier into you know, whatever storage unit you may be using to to store decoys um, they're much lighter weight, so if you have to walk into a place, you can usually, you know, you and two or three buddies can take five to ten dozen silhouettes plus all your stuff in, and you have a pretty good spread if you're going to go in and hunt a piece of public land that you have to walk into to get to them. Um, another thing you'll see down there in the bottom is a, a flag. Now, flagging can be very, very um, important especially you know in any situation when you're hunting geese because it's it's an attention grabber is what it is so you're really just out there using a flag trying to get their attention trying to catch their eye to uh, resemble birds moving in the flock of decoys that you have out or birds landing in the decoys just to give a little bit more confidence and realism into your spread as birds are approaching or if they're on their corners when they're kind of coming across the field at you, you can hit them with a flag and that might catch their eye and give them more of a reason to turn towards you and, and come in and check out your setup. And then you have floating decoys. Um, obviously these are used relatively always in a water situation. Um, and uh, you can really pack a lot of a lot of punch. It's kind of like using full bodies, but in water. They're very realistic. Uh, they tend to be very lightweight. Um, and you can kind of just simulate geese on water in a resting area or in a loafing area for wherever they may be. 
Um, so more equipment to get started is um, I'll touch a little bit here on on calls. So short read calls, I'll start with. Um, as you can see in the in the photo there on top, those are um, three different kind of two different styles of calls, but three different um, materials that they're made out of. So the one all the way to the left is made out of wood. The one in the middle is acrylic and the one all the way on the right is a, actually a rubber material. And all three of those are going to create a different kind of sound and based off of how large the call is, it will either be create a higher pitch sound for you and a faster response when you're using the call or it'll create a lower pitch sound um, to resemble um, maybe much larger Canada geese um, in the area or you could use the smaller calls will get you a much faster response much higher pitch if you're dealing with a lot of geese or if you're in a big wide open area it gives you a little bit more range to reach out there and and kind of touch those those birds that might be a long ways out um, and then on the bottom is uh, flute calls uh, those are an you know an older style of calls those, those have been around for a long 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 time um, and they're just as just as effective um, when you know how to use them as a short read is um, a tip for calling less is definitely more especially when you're starting out um, i would I recommend to a lot of people to learn like two or three basic notes and just stick with that. Um, reading birds when they're coming in is a lot more important than sounding exactly like a goose. If you can read birds and know how to specifically target one bird or a couple birds in the flock that may seem like they want to come and check out the decoy spread versus the whole the rest of the other flock, that might be on a line going to where they want to go. If you can communicate with that one bird and can get him turned around, more often than not, you'll be able to turn either the whole flock around or you'll be able to turn several other ones around. And then once you get that whole group working, you can just kind of start to figure out as you do it more, reading those birds and seeing what they're liking. So if they're, if they're coming and their wing beats are just steady and they're locked up, and you're hitting them with one note, just stay on that note the whole way in. Don't change a thing. Don't fix it if it's not broken because there's no reason for you to change the type of call you're using as they're coming in uh, if they're already committed and they're coming right at you. Um, I recommend to go on YouTube and some other sites that uh, we will actually be um, sending an email after this uh, webinar goes out to learn how to call and understand what goes into the calls themselves and how to properly use them the more you can learn how to do that and the better of a caller you become and the more you can learn how to read birds and and decipher their body language as they're coming in the more successful you're going to be as a hunter down the road um, and another tip that is pretty important um, that might get overlooked sometimes is placement of your collars in relation to how you have your decoys set up. So we'll go over decoys a little bit later in this, but when you're when you set your decoys and you're setting up your blinds to for where your collars are going to be and where everyone's going to sit try and remember that the birds are going to come to where the largest bulk of decoys is especially late in this later as the season gets later they're going to come to the larger group of decoys and they're going to come to where the calling is mainly coming from so if you have your decoys set up for a certain wind situation and your collar is way downwind of where the top of the decoy spread is you may accidentally by not knowing this you may set those birds off of where your hole is that you're trying to get them to come to so you may set them downwind further than you would actually like so what i like to do is i like to set if i have one or two callers in the group i like to set them 
upwind on the upwind side of the decoy spread and where the bulk of the decoys is to kind of pull those birds up into the up into the hole that way everybody that is there that's on the hunt can kind of get an equal opportunity when the birds come in that way they're centered up and they're not offsetting their um, their landing to one side or the other um, some more equipment to get started um, i definitely recommend um, waterproof clothing um, and for you to dress warm enough for the weather you're going to be hunting in. there's nothing that ruins a hunt more um, than being cold and wet um, i've had that happen a lot of times and it is definitely not fun being cold and wet um, when you're out on a hunt especially when there might not be much going on during the hunt it only makes it that much more uh unbearable to deal with that kind of situation um, waterproof uh, boots and waders is something that you're probably going to definitely invest in especially if you're hunting in areas where they're you're going to be dealing with water um and then wearing a life vest too when you're hunting from a boat um, safety is always huge it's always the first thing you have to think of whenever you're going out hunting um, water is an unforgivable thing uh, especially when it's cold and from november uh, we have listed here from november 1st to april 30th it is required um, to have when you're hunting from a boat um, and it's just something that you should always have with you just from a safety standpoint so that that way you know you're as safe as you can possibly be when you're hunting from a boat finding a place to hunt so where can where can you hunt? So there's a lot of state game lands uh, in in, our, in the state, uh, state forest lands, state parks. And again, when you're hunting those lands, make sure you do your homework on that land when you go in and you know where safety zones are. Um, and if you go in in the dark, you know, and you run into people that may already be there, try and find another spot and pick a different place to hunt in that area that is far enough away from the other groups so that that way um, you guys can have like a, a more more peace of mind when you're hunting and knowing that if you're shooting in a certain direction you're not going to be reaching another group of people that might be hunting in that area um, and uh, a big part of the state is private land now, knocking on doors can get you a permission to a lot of property um, but be ready to hear no. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've knocked on doors and heard the word no, but I mean, that's the worst that's going to happen when you go to ask someone permission to hunt their property. So um, always ask for permission um, and look for uh, cooperator properties that might um, be in line with the Pennsylvania Game Commission um, that may be willing to um, grant access to their land basically on a public access but um, you still need to go up and ask them for permission and they will then grant you access but that's something that you can check out um, for further information on that on our pgc website uh, finding a place to hunt so we have uh, special hunt opportunities um, with the pennsylvania game commission and um, can i'll kind of lean on you a little bit more for these um these areas as you may know a little bit more than me yeah uh, yeah studies. happy to jump in here so we have two game lands uh, with really special waterfowl hunting opportunities there are pima tuning wildlife area up in the northwest portion of the state and middle creek wildlife area in the southeast uh, we have controlled hunts on these areas so hunting is only allowed on a certain number of days of the week and to a certain number of people uh, this reduces hunting pressure and helps uh, keep quality hunting uh, in that area for a longer period of time. Uh, you can apply to hunt in these areas uh, for the goose blinds. Um, the dates to apply for those are on the screen there. You see it varies by each unit, but each, each of these areas have their own blinds. So if you don't have blinds, you can go out there and hunt in the blinds. 
uh, it's really great for beginner hunters because you you have the blinds, you know they're going to be um, waterfowl that aren't as pressured, and so it's, it can be a little easier to hunt. Um, if you don't get drawn preseason for a goose blind, there are opportunities to continue to try to hunt those goose blinds later in the year for people who don't show up. And then each area also has uh, waterfowl blinds to hunt ducks, and those um, you can't do um, before the season. For Middle Creek, you um, put in for one of those a week ahead of time, and for time of tuning, I believe it's the morning of. So to get more details, go to the link that we're going to provide um, at the end of this webinar to, that provides a lot more detail on these hunts, but they are a great place to go for specifically new hunters, but for any uh, skill of waterfowl hunter, there's they're great places to go. So some scouting tips. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do when you're scouting for geese, no matter the time of the year, is find out where um, where their roost location is, or if you go out middle of the day, find where they're loafing at. Um, this will allow you to kind of get a good general area of where those birds are probably going to be hanging out. Um, early in the year, usually they're hanging out and feeding in fields that are closer to where um, their roost sites are. Now they will travel um, a good distance um, sometimes early in the year, but more often than not, they're probably pretty close to where they're going to be roosting. So from that point, once you find out where they're where they're roosting, you're going to want to follow them to where they're feeding in those locations. So early in the year, um, especially now, um, going out and finding cut wheat fields or hay fields or uh, silage fields that'll be coming off here in a few weeks, um, anything like that, cow, cattle pastures, stuff like that, that might be in the area of where geese are roosting. And then you can kind of use, um, so to the next point, use this to help you out as well, but using uh, maps like Onyx or Base Map or HuntWise, stuff like that, to kind of mark those locations pre-season so that when you go out and you're looking for these birds in, in the areas that you found that they're roosting in, you can kind of give yourself a base area of where to start to look. Um, and then and then go from there to once you find the birds but following them to their feeding locations is going to be your best bet so if you can sit outside of where they're roosting and then when they leave in the mornings you can follow them to where their feed locations are and then if they're if they're on public land then you know just continue to watch them as the season gets closer or as it gets closer to your hunt and just kind of keep a keep an eye on on those birds and where they're going in those fields and then when you're ready to hunt you can go in and um, and set up and hunt those birds and then you have a good general idea of where those birds are um, going to be in the field um, when you go into hunt now if they're on private land you're going to want to go up and try and gain access to that by asking permission from the landowner if you can hunt the, those birds um that is you know something again that can open the door to a lot of other places for you to hunt that landowner may not just own that one field and you know he when you go up and ask he or she may be you know willing to let you hunt other pieces of property that they may um, have um, permission to either give you or own the land and, and can tell you kind of where to go from there and the landowners can be a wealth of information as well um, so if you build up a good relationship with them lean on that too to um, kind of have in your back pocket of you know they see these fields all the time so they'll know when the birds are going to be there, when they are there, what time of the year they're usually there, when they've been hanging out, that kind of stuff. Um, considering the time of day to go scout. So really, you're going to want to scout in the mornings, early and in the afternoons. Um, early in the year, like 
this time of the year in September, the geese are usually headed out to the fields pretty early in the morning. They're probably headed out around 6.30, 6.45 right now, I would guess, on a sunny day. Um, and they're headed out to the fields, and then they're probably going to hang out there till uh, around 9, 9.30, and then they'll probably head back to either their roost or they'll head back to a spot that they're going to loaf um, in for the afternoon, and then they'll head back out um, towards dark around seven o'clock right now um, to go back out and have an afternoon feed um, for that for that day. Uh, watching the weather is big for scouting. Changes in weather, changes in temperature, changes in you know any inclement weather will change how the birds are acting in the field and when they decide to leave um, the roost in the morning and in the afternoon. Typically on sunny days, you're gonna see birds come out a lot higher and in a lot bigger groups than they would on a cloudy day, where they'll tend to, or a rainy day, where they'll tend to trickle out of their roost in smaller groups and they'll come out a little bit later in the day, in the morning versus um, when it's sunnier due to the, the overcast and um, lack of light earlier in the morning. Uh, investing in a good pair of binoculars is good just to be able to see birds from a, uh, a distance if you can't get close enough to the field. Um, that way you can kind of see maybe where they're at in the field from a distance or you can kind of see maybe there's a rise in the field that they're sitting behind that you may not be able to see them from the road with your naked eye. You can kind of use binoculars to you know maybe pick out their head just on the back side of a hill just another tool to kind of help you out when you're scouting. Picking your hunt location once you find um, the birds and you either gain access to uh, the land to hunt, or if you're hunting on public land, this can work too. So there's two kind of scenarios you're gonna be hunting for waterfowl in general. Um, so hunting the X and hunting traffic. Those are two totally different things. Hunting the X is the location where the geese are going to feed. That's the spot in the field or the area that they are, all the birds in that area or the majority of the birds in that area are going to. And that's where they want to be. So that's where you try and be. Now you can't always be there um, and that's okay. Um, now the X is the roost site is not an X. The roost site is the roost site. I strongly discourage hunting roost sites due to the fact that it can put an enormous amount of pressure on the birds. And if you hit that more than once, um, you could actually completely push the birds off that place and force them into a totally different location than where they're feeling is safe at that point so you could end up having to completely change everything you're doing completely change all the locations that you've been scouting and getting permission for if you end up pushing those birds off those sites and um, having them all come out at once and just creating a hectic environment for them they're going to end up going to find a place that's safer for them uh, that they're not feeling that pressure um, now hunting the x is a great thing um, but sometimes it's not always the best move especially if it's hard to hide um, where the x is uh, if you can't hide your success rate is going to drop significantly those geese will pick you out no matter the time of the year um, and early in the year something i want to touch on too the X might be literally a specific spot in the field. So if you're not in that exact spot, you could be 50 to 100 yards off and they're going to come in and they're going to land 50 to 100 yards away from where you set up because it's not where they've actually been exactly in the field. Um, so it's it's important to really do your due diligence when you're scouting and figure out that exact spot in the field to be. Um, and then hunting traffic. I personally like to hunt traffic um, a lot. It's, I have the ability to use you know, larger decoy spreads, being that I've 
been hunting these birds for years and years and years. I've built up a pretty good size decoy spread with the group of guys that I hunt with. Um, now, when I say that, when we're running traffic, um, we're probably going to hunt anywhere between 10 dozen to 20 dozen decoys. Um, you don't always need that many. I know that might sound like a big number, but you don't always need that much to hunt a traffic spot, especially if it's a good area that you're right underneath the birds um, when they're coming off of their roost site or their low site um, for the day to feed. And then um, the traffic spot is so you're hunting birds that are going, you're trying to get in between the birds where they're coming from and where they're going to and pull them to a place that they are not they either haven't been to or haven't been to in a while um and the reason that i like hunting these spots is um because they don't know what the field might look like as well as they do what the x might look like when they're on the x they know that field inside and out they know what should be there they know what shouldn't be there so when you go into an x spot like I said before, you better be hidden, whereas hunting a traffic spot, you still need to be hidden, but you can kind of get away with a little bit more on a traffic spot versus um, that on an X um, location. Using decoys is huge on a traffic spot. The more you can use, um, the better off you're going to be probably hunting traffic. Um, you're trying to pull those birds to a place that like I said, they haven't been before. So you need to kind of pull out a good amount of stops in order to bring them to you and to get them convinced that, hey, this is where we're feeding this afternoon or this morning, whereas they might be going somewhere else. Um, and you're trying to just pull them off that line of where they're going to. Hunting tips and tactics. So um, hunting weather conditions so sunny days um, versus cloudy days like i said before um, birds are going to come off on a sunny day typically a lot higher and in a lot larger volume later in the year especially than they will earlier in the year once more birds start to come into the area you'll start to see bigger groups headed out at in the mornings and in the afternoons and on those sunny days they're going to come out a lot higher uh, and in a lot larger groups than they would versus um, cloudy days or days that is um, inclement weather um, usually they'll come off a little bit later in the morning and they'll kind of trickle out of their roost location um, in smaller groups which is ideal because that's what you want the less eyes you have looking at you when they're coming into your decoy spread and the less birds you have to convince to bring into the decoys, the better off you're going to be. Um, let's see, uh, windy, windy days versus um, no wind or minimal wind. Um, typically a good wind to hunt waterfowl in is anywhere from like 10 to 15 miles an hour or like close to that. Now this, is going to help the birds get to the ground quicker um, and they're going to feel a lot more comfortable coming into the decoys and you can kind of set the way you set your decoys up on a wind on a good wind day will help kind of center those birds up versus on a on a non-windy day they're going to circle a lot more they may you know take several passes at your decoys before they get within range so patience is a not only a huge key in general but it's a huge key on uh, non-windy days or um, low wind days just to be able to have that patience and knowing you may have to work those birds a little bit more um, to get them to commit to the decoy spread versus uh, a windy day where it the wind is perfect it's at your back or it's coming from one side or the other and they just come right in um, now you can get days where it's extremely windy and what i've noticed too <clears throat> on those kinds of days is um, birds will typically come they'll approach a lot lower to your decoy spread and they'll tend to land 
just on the outskirts of your decoy spread. So on a like high windy days, I would recommend kind of opening up um, your landing spot a little bit more for them so that they can come up into that versus where on a you know a 10 to 15 mile an hour wind day that's like kind of perfect you can kind of set your decoy spread that you'll see i have one here later in the slides that i'll show you but you can kind of set the bulk of your decoys and then sprinkle some little groups in throughout um, your hole and then making a bigger hole kind of for them to come to um, they may set on the outside of that on a super windy day on those little groups that are outside so they may end up landing just outside of range so just be aware of of that um, on a super windy day and then going back to um, low wind days or hot or no no wind days opening up your your hole again will allow them to feel a little bit more comfortable and give them more of an area to kind of target to um, on those days that they're feeling is harder for them to get down into the ground and get into your decoys. Hunting uh, tips and tactics time of the year. So early in the year, um, geese will tend to be in smaller family groups. Now there may be 100 birds in a field and that's a good little bunch for not this time of the year but they may be spread out in the field and they may um, be in little family groups to where later in the year, they're gonna be in much larger groups in the field. You'll see several hundred together where it doesn't look like they're in family groups. It kind of looks like they're all in the same kind of spot and you can't really decipher those family groups apart from those non-family groups. And then, um, <clears throat> As you get, as it gets warm, uh, colder throughout the year, you're going to see those birds come off of the roost a little bit later in the day, uh, in the mornings, and then a little bit earlier in the afternoons too. Versus when it's warmer, they're going to come off earlier in the mornings usually, and then they may not move in the afternoon if it's warm until like last legal light or um, even after legal light and they'll come out and feed for just a little bit on those warm days where they don't feel that urgency to get out there and and provide that energy for their body when on cold um, cold days they have that sense of urgency that they need to go out they need to provide energy to their body they need to feed um, in those grain fields to give that um, give that energy to them so you'll see them head out earlier in the afternoon and a little bit later in the morning um, so that they can get out at more optimal times during the day to feed longer. Um, and that kind of goes back to your scouting to um, be aware of that. As it gets colder, birds may start moving um, later in the morning and earlier in the afternoon. And when it gets really, really cold, like below freezing, any like down into the 20s and the teens um, i've noticed that geese will actually completely skip the morning feed at least in my area they'll completely skip their morning feed and they won't come out off of water until like two o'clock in the afternoon um, and then they'll feed all day in the afternoon they'll feed from two o'clock till dark um, and you know that's a that time of the year is really good to be out because they're kind of in like a survival mode they're in a they're in a mode where they're a lot more susceptible to to decoys especially if you can be in a good area um they want to find places to feed they want to find food especially if there's snow on the field and you've got um, decoys out that's a good indicator for them that hey there's food down there you know um, let's go and Let's go down there and check it out. Um, and then I will go to hunting tips and tactics on blind types. So I discussed these a little bit earlier, um, but I'm going to kind of hit on the benefits of each one and kind of kind of the types that they're mostly used in. So the top one there is your 
um, panel blinds. There's a, some good brands out there that make uh, panel blinds right now. Um, you can use them pretty much anywhere. You can use them in the middle of the field if you've got enough cover for it and the stubble's high enough. You can use them on the edges of the field. You can use them like in this picture where I mean we're set up in you know about knee deep water there. Um, so they're they're pretty pretty handy in um, wherever you know you may be looking to hunt. Um, and then you have layout blinds. So layout blinds are a lot more low profile. Um, they get you, they can get you out in the middle of the field and they can get you hidden very well out in the middle of the field where the birds may want to be. Now, in saying that, panel blinds are a lot more comfortable to hunt out of um, and can make the process a little bit more enjoyable for you if you're someone who has a hard time sitting up out of a layout blind and laying on the ground um, and stuff like that. Um, they're both, you know, very good options. Um, so another type of blind is a natural blind that you can use, especially if you're hunting an edge versus the middle of the field. Um, panel blinds and natural blinds on the edges of fields are, are a great tool to use when hunting that type of scenario on the edge. And when you're hunting an edge, you know, a lot of people see birds out in the middle of the field and they want to get out into the middle of the field with those geese. And that's not always the case that you have to do. Um, my group of guys that I hunt with, um, we hunt edges a lot. Um, and we have just as much success, if not more success, on the edges of the fields than we do out in the middle. One, because usually the edges of the field provide a lot more cover and a lot better of a spot to be hidden than the middle of the field does. Um, so you have that added benefit as well um, when you're hunting the edge versus hunting out in the middle of the field. Now, the middle of the field will obviously provide you the exact spot where those birds probably are in the field. Um, and a lot more um, confidence in them coming in right off the bat on the first pass versus maybe taking a couple more passes when you're set up on the edge where maybe they haven't been yet. Um, but panel blinds, layout blinds, natural blinds, just remember to check your regulations though. Um, if you're on public land, when using a natural blind, um, if you're trying to create a natural blind with brush or stuff like that, check your, um, check your regulations and uh, make sure that that is legal to do on public land because I know that there's definitely um, places where you're not allowed to construct um, blinds out of natural material that is there. You're not allowed to cut stuff down to make a blind um, on, on public land. Hunting tips and tactics for um, decoy setup. So this is a tip for a uh, wind at your back. So typically, if you have a wind at your back, um, that's a pretty good, pretty good wind to have, um, especially if it's a good wind. Like I said, that 10 to 15 mile an hour wind range. Um, when the birds are coming in, they're going to land into the wind, so it kind of gives you, it gives you that shot at the entire vital range, and it opens up that area for you. Versus if they're if you're shooting at their back, that you have a lot. A lot less to kind of aim at than you would if they're coming straight on at you. Um, but you can see here, you can kind of set your decoys up um, in kind of the formation that you want to use to hump that wind at your back. A lot of people will set their decoys up in a U formation or a V or a J or an L or some sort of letter like that. Um, I like to try and tell people to set your decoys how you see the geese in the field the day before or the morning before you go out and hunt. The more realistic you can be, the better off you're going to be in the long run um, of things. Now, um, you know, that being said, we're human. We're going to kind of usually we're going to generally make some sort of shape to center them up into a hole um, that I'll show you on the next slide. 
So as you can see here, you can see the decoy spread, um, the blind location I have highlighted that we had in the middle of the field that day. Um, now this is probably about, uh, I wanna say it's probably about roughly 20 dozen decoys, mix of full bodies and sleeper shells that we were hunting in the snow. Um, so we're hunting a crosswind here. So how I have it set up is we're actually set up out of the decoys. I like to be set up out of the decoys because when geese are coming in, especially late in the year, they're looking for anything that could be wrong when they're coming into a field. Um, so if you set yourself out of the decoys, that's just another variable that you've taken out of their mind when they're coming in and they're approaching. If you maybe didn't camel your, your blind up good enough and you're in the decoys, you know, they pick that out and they're you know they're up and out of there versus where here when they're coming in from a crosswind one they're not even looking at the blind when they're coming in because they're coming in from left to right versus straight on at you and two you're out of the decoys so if they're looking in the decoys they're not going to see anything out of the norm that they may be trying to look for like a layup blind because as the season goes on you've got to remember these birds have been migrating down, you know, if you're hunting migratory birds, they've been coming down from Canada and they've been hunted from September 1 all the way up until this point. So they've seen probably just about every trick in the book. Um, so they're looking for danger anywhere it might be coming from. So on this day, we had um, a pretty good wind. We had, like I said, about a 10, 10 to 15 mile an hour wind coming from our right side. Um, so which would mean the birds are approaching from our left and you can see the hole that we create. We set up the bulk of our decoys and I'm up on the right side of the blind with another guy calling um, to try and pull the birds up past everybody and up to the top of that that spread. So that when we start shooting and they try and get up out of there, they're going to go with the wind when they try and get out of there normally. So when you pull them all the way up to the front of the spread, you're giving everyone an equal opportunity to start shooting immediately. And then when they come up and they start to bail out of the spread, when you start shooting, it's actually almost giving you another opportunity as they head out in that wind to kind of keep them centered up um, as, as you're trying to pick your birds out as you're going through. Um, so how I have this decoy spread set up, um, in the middle there where you see those little groups of decoys those are probably sleeper shells that we set out and then the right side of the decoy spread that i have bulked up there is essentially my stopper it's just an arm to stop them from either going too far or landing too shy of the decoy spread so if they're landing shy of the spread a little bit too much and not centering up with the blind and the shooters and like too far left in this situation i'll take that group of decoys that goes up and out to the right and i'll move it further to the right to hopefully kind of set them centered more and if they're jumping if they're jumping the hole and they're coming up into the center of that bulk of decoys or right up on that edge I'll take that arm and I'll just move it back to the left a little bit to try and center them up to where the blinds are so that everybody has like an equal opportunity um, of getting a good uh, shot on the birds as they come in. Hunting tips and tactics with a dog. So hunting with a dog um, is great. Um, it's a huge benefit. One, it saves miles on your legs. Um, it saves you having to run around like a maniac when birds are coming in um, after you just shot into a group and you're trying to pick up geese and the decoys. You know, that's just a, you know, four legs. Them on four legs is a lot faster than you on two, um, especially when you're in water. You know, they can go get a bird in water a lot faster than you can. Um, and that kind of gives you that added companionship. In, in the blind, um, it brings up brings up the morale a little bit when you got a dog out there, I feel. Um, and hunting, hunting with a dog too, for me personally, totally changed kind of my outlook on waterfowl hunting and hunting in general 
and I'm no like when you're when you're going hunting, the end goal is, you know, the goal when you go out is to try and harvest birds. But uh, ever since getting a dog, it's kind of opened up things for me and and helped bring me along a lot quicker to learn that, you know, it's not always about going out there and harvesting birds or shooting a limit of geese or shooting a limit of ducks, you know, getting to see a, a good dog work on a hunt is fantastic. And, you know, it can, a good dog can turn a good hunt into a, a great hunt real quick. Um, some things you want to remember though, when hunting with a dog is safety. Safety is huge in general, but hunting with a dog, it adds that just a little bit more detail you have to pay attention to to make sure that everyone in the hunting party is is on the same page if you're hunting with multiple people um if the just in case the dog ends up happens to break it happens um you know if the dog breaks before people start shooting and the dog runs out and in the middle of the field you want to make sure that everyone is aware that that could happen and if that does happen that they understand to either stop shooting or not shoot at all for the safety of the dog that's out in the field there's no bird that is worth the dog's life and there's no bird that's worth your life and that's something that you always have to remember when you're out hunting so be smart about those situations when you involve a dog in hunting that you know they're not aware of the of the risk factor that you are with a firearm. You know, they just want to go and get that bird that's coming in and they want to do their job more than you probably would think. Um, so just be mindful of those things when hunting with a dog is that safety is so much more important and you need to be aware of those things. Um, hunting in cold weather uh, with a dog make sure your dog has a vest one it helps with flotation and two it helps with insulation uh, for the dog it keeps the dog warm um, it keeps the dog um, it helps the dog swim a lot easier um, gives them a little bit more to float and i mean you wouldn't believe how warm a dog is when you i've stuck my hands down in my dog's vest um, on super cold days to warm my hands up um, so that just that little bit of insulation really helps out a dog on cold days um, and you too want to make sure your dog's hydrated um, and fed well especially if you're out there on long hunts during the day um see if i have anything else you know and to just be mindful of, of cold temperatures for freezing water um, stuff like that with a dog um, you know they're like you they can get hypothermia they can get, you know, other stuff that could be fatal to them if you send them out in water um, on cold days and you just never want to see that happen. So just be mindful of the weather and uh, what you're sending your dog into uh, and make sure you're comfortable with that as well. Field the table. So. Um, we're going to provide a link here down in the bottom of this slide to kind of give you a visual on how to uh, clean a goose. But oh, you want to try and wear gloves whenever you do something like this, just to protect yourself. And afterwards, washing your hands is is important too. Um, you can either um, grab in the middle of the of the chest and pluck the feathers away, and then um, use your knife and cut underneath uh, the skin without cutting into the meat along the breastbone and then you can stick your fingers in there and you can pull the um, the skin apart away from the breast um, and then you're going to want to just cut along the breastbone from the top all the way to the bottom try and you know as close you, as you can get to that breastbone to try and get as much meat off there as you possibly can um, and then afterwards, if you're not going to um, eat it right away, um, make sure you, no matter what you're doing, if you're eating it right away or not, make sure you wash the meat, go and wash the meat, properly prepare it, uh, and then you freeze that meat and label it. I recommend labeling the bag so that you know 
down the road, if you wait a while to eat that meat, you know when it was harvested and what kind of bird it is. Um, and then to um, if you're doing that in the field, remember you have to have uh, a wing attached to the breast. If you're um, field dressing geese, migratory, any migratory game bird in the field, you need to have a wing attached to the breast. Or I think there's a there's another thing you might be able to do too. And I recommend uh, getting tags and tagging that as well so that if you get checked and you've field dressed um, migra a migratory game bird in the field, uh, waterfowl especially, and you get checked, you can get a ticket for that. Um, so that is something to be aware of too. Um, I always breast out my birds when I get back to my house um, so that that way I don't have to keep, you know, that in mind i'll tag you know sometimes we'll tag the birds and bring them back if there's a bunch of us and we're traveling back in one vehicle that way we can differentiate whose birds were who in case for some reason we get stopped by a game warden um, on the way to the house or we get checked for some reason like that um that is a it is a federal law um, that you have to have a, at least a wing attached if you are um, transporting uh, waterfowl um, through throughout the state or from one state to the other. Um, and that's something that you can also find more information about and that I recommend you look at more information about um, on either our PGC website or looking up the federal regulations on that as well. Um, and if you're consuming um, the meat right away, uh, you can make sure you go in, you just wash that meat thoroughly. Um, I believe 165 degrees is what they recommend cooking the uh, meat temperature to. I try to stay anywhere from medium to medium rare. If you go past medium, starts the meat start to get a little bit tougher. Um, but you want to kind of stay in that medium, medium rare, and in that 165 temperature range. Um, you can make a lot of stuff out of goose. We make goose jerky. We make goose poppers. Um, we send um, our stuff off to have bologna, um, sausage, hot sticks made, pretty much anything with a deer that you can do, you can do with a goose. So um, those are just some ways, um, some ideas uh, to prep your birds after you've harvested them. Yep, that's good. So that kind of, that concludes uh, this portion of the Learn to Hunt Waterfowl series. Okay. So, thank you. We'll open it to questions. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go into questions, which uh, we did get a question in the chat. Um, if anybody has questions that you did not yet um, put in, go ahead and type those into the chat. Um, we do realize that we were having a little bit of an issue earlier with people typing in the chat, but it should be fixed now. Um, so please feel free to put those in there. I'm going to ask the question that we got in the chat first. And then I honestly have eight of my own questions that good. as a completely brand new uh, waterfowl hunter, never, no experience whatsoever that I have questions about that maybe somebody else might want clarification on too. Um, so we did get a question on how many decoys do you recommend? That's a very broad <laughs> um so if you're hunting an x you don't need as many decoys as if you're hunting a traffic spot personally um this time of the year in september you're not so i guess the best way to say it is the more birds you're hunting the more decoys you're probably going to want especially if you're hunting a traffic spot as the year goes on um this time of the year, um, if you find a field that's got more than 100 geese in it, you've got a pretty good field in September. Uh, and even around 100 geese in a field this time of the year is pretty good. But I'm not really using anything more than two to three dozen this early in the year in September. Later in September, 
um, if we have birds that you know move from other areas or start to maybe come down a little bit earlier uh, than normal due to weather conditions i'll up the decoy spread a little bit i'll use more um, it's whatever you can afford really you know whatever you can afford to purchase um, to use uh, that's what i recommend doing you know you can't you can't you can't decoy geese without decoys so okay. that was going to be my follow-up question to that is because i think the individual is probably wondering like you know if you were brand new just starting out and maybe you can't afford to buy like 20 decoys start like can you get by with like five could you like just until you can build or um, is there like a certain minimal number it depends on where you're hunting so i mean i would rec if you can have around five dozen anywhere between any anywhere between i would say three and five dozen that'll kind of get you by for like the better portion of the year um now that may not work in some scenarios you may get in a traffic spot and try and use that and and they'll just blow right on by you like you're not even there um i've used uh, two decoys two floater decoys on a small river and I decoyed geese in this small little creeks with two floater decoys. It all just kind of really depends on their mood. Uh, you know, it's 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 kind of like you know luck of the draw almost with how many decoys you want to use. Now I've been on ec uh, I've been on um, traffic spots and I've used thirty to forty dozen decoys, and they have a spot in their mind of where they want to go and they blow right on by me like i'm not even there i'll use we use silhouettes we use shells we use full bodies um and something i definitely touch on if you have the ability to if you're able to purchase different kinds of decoys or or a good amount of decoys is that early in the year in september don't throw the kitchen sink at them right away don't throw everything if you can if you have the ability to do that don't throw everything you can at them right away because as the season wears on especially in september towards the end of september if it gets cold enough earlier you may see new birds start to come down from north of you and those birds are going to depend on the resident geese that are in that area to tell them where the food is one and where the danger is so if you've thrown the kitchen sink at those resident geese that you've been hunting for two to three weeks and you've been hunting them every weekend when those new birds come in they're you know they're going to follow those resident geese and those resident geese are going to get real smart real quick so if you can kind of pressure manage geese and waterfowl in general as best you can that is something that I definitely recommend, especially in September when there's not as many geese to work with as there will be later in the year. Now, when there's more geese later in the year, um, you know, you can throw out a big decoy spread or use the same decoy spread um, more often because you'll be seeing different geese or usually day to day, especially if it's cold and birds are constantly moving throughout the area and from other areas um but one thing i recommend to do is is to just change it up and to keep you know just to keep them essentially on their toes of you know you don't want them to see the same thing over and over and over and over and over because then they're gonna associate that with danger and then they're you know gonna get wise and they're gonna end up just completely bypassing you or not even paying you any attention and you're going to wonder why they're not coming in when it worked before but now it's not working that's probably why they have probably smartened up to your tactics so you need to change those up i want to point out something that john was saying when he was talking about how many decoys he kept saying we because he hunts with a group of people yeah. and he mentioned this at the beginning if you're new to it try to find mentors existing waterfowl hunters find a group of friends so that you don't have to buy yes all those decoys yes. you're sharing them with your hunting buddies or with other dedicated waterfowl hunters that makes that a lot easier 
uh, for new hunters. So yeah, you all yes. pitch in and get five or ten, and like yeah, yeah everybody, everybody gets a dozen. And, and you know, utilize um, social media. I mean, there's a lot of people that are out there selling stuff for cheap, you know, stuff they've used over the years that they're maybe looking to upgrade on. Um, and I mean, just because it's an older style of decoy doesn't mean it won't work. We've used, we still use older styles of decoys and you know, and they work. I'll say I've uh, just like antiquing myself. I have found a lot of used decoys <laughs> at like antique shops, which I know may not be, they're not new. They're not like modern, but put a little new paint on it or something. It might work. There's, there's people in the South that use black bottles as floater decoys. They just paint them black. There's a lot of them and they're cheap, but it works sometimes. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. People cut tires in half and use those down in uh, Maryland and Delaware. They'll use, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, if you, if it if it works, it works. Whatever you can afford is what I recommend getting decoy number wise. The more, the better, because then it kind of opens up, you know, more opportunity for you to kind of give a little bit of variation here and there. Okay, cool. I have a follow-up decoy question. Um, and this is my own personal question. In uh, the presentation, we showed two decoy like land setups, basically. Um, and I know you had said earlier, kind of try and replicate like if you're scouting birds and you see how they land in a field, try and replicate that. But I also noticed in the setups, there's kind of like a a crescent, a, a shape that yeah. you're following. Do you follow that same shape in the water? Or is that completely different? It's usually, so the way that I'll try and set up a spread is usually completely based off of the wind direction and the landscape that I'm hunting. Um, geese are gonna wanna tend to land, like, so if you're hunting a flat field, you don't, you're not really gonna run into this, but if you're hunting a, a field that has hills or, you know, a big knob or something like that, that's something that you're gonna wanna kind of pay attention to. Cause there's been times where we've gone in, in, in the dark and we've set our decoy spread and there's like a little knob, they're gonna land right on top of that. And it might be 50, 60 yards away, and you may not notice it in the dark, but when the sun comes up and you see it, I just about guarantee you they're going to land right on top of that little knob outside your decoy spread. So if you do see it in the dark, maybe set your either try and get away from that or set your decoys in accordance to the landscape. So maybe put decoys there on that spot to push them to a off that knob, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, um, and like I said before, you know, we're human, so we're going to kind of create a shape usually in our head based off of how we want the birds to land, but just try and be realistic as, as possible. Um, you saw that I kind of put out like little groups in that um v shape i guess you could say it was um that just kind of tries to what i like to try and do with my decoy spread too is is you want to tell a story with the decoy spread you want to try and paint a picture to them so when they're coming in those little groups of decoys that were out in the in the hole away from the bulk of decoys to me, I'm trying to tell them that this group of birds has been here, they've fed through that area, and those birds are now resting in that spot on the snow, especially in snow, you'll see geese sitting a lot. So what they'll do is they'll try and melt the snow, they'll get up, they'll move a foot or two away, they'll sit back down and they'll eat in that spot in the snow that they melted. Um, and with your decoy spread, essentially what you're doing with your decoy spread is you're you're telling them where the food is and where the food is not. So um, doing that and painting that picture for them as they're coming in um, 
will help you help them be more confident about where they need to set up uh, into the decoy spread. It's important to remember when thinking about decoys is that geese aren't exactly agile birds. Yeah. Um, so when he was talking about putting a bunch of decoys on that knob, it's because if they're too close together, geese aren't going to try to land in there because they're going to be afraid of yeah. landing on top of another bird. So they will lay into holes in the in the spread, mm -hmm. which is why he's putting those blank areas in there. Yep. It's creating a spot for geese to land safely. Yep. And geese too will want to land, essentially kind of piggybacking off of that, geese are going to want to land in between other geese if they can. Because I, if you think about it, if you're in a, in a crowd of, of people and dangers coming in from the outside of that crowd of people, everybody else is going to warn you about that danger that's coming and you're more likely to get away from that danger than they are because now you're in you're in the middle kind of surrounded by them so you can depend on them to tell you if danger is coming and you may are more likely to be more relaxed in a situation like that bird wise um, knowing that you have all those eyes around you looking out for that for that danger. Cool. Um, we got another question that came in. Um, can you train any breed of dog for waterfowl hunting? Uh, yes, but yeah. I wouldn't recommend yeah. it. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, a dachshund's going to be smaller than a goose, so you're not going to be able to get it to retrieve one. Um, <laughs> Just drag it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I guess you could, but I don't recommend it. Like you said, um, you know, you want to try and stick to your more traditional, you know, water dogs or hunting dogs in general. Now, that being said, I've seen people train Jack Russells to retrieve dogs, uh, retrieve dogs to retrieve ducks and geese. Now that's out west, where the geese are a lot smaller than here. Um, but here you're going to, you know, you're going to want to, you're going to want a dog that can handle cold weather, uh, larger birds. Like you said, you could run up to geese that are anywhere from, you know, 10 to 12 to maybe even a little bit larger in size pound wise. Um, so if you have a smaller dog, they may not be able to handle that as well as a, a larger dog could. Um, now there's going to be variations in sizes amongst breeds themselves female dogs will definitely tend to be a little bit smaller than a male will um you know you've got chesapeake bay retrievers um, there's pointing dogs that you can train to be waterfowl dogs there's waterfowl pointing dogs um, you've got yellow labs black labs chocolate labs um, and then there's variations within those labs where you have an English and American labs. Um, English labs are a little bit bulkier. They've got a bigger head. Um, they tend to be a little bit on the bigger side um, where they'll carry a little bit more weight with them versus an American. Will be, could be a, usually is a little bit thinner, um, a little bit less weight, um, a lot faster usually. But um, up here, I would, in the Northeast especially, where, I mean, it can get cold really fast. I would, I would be hesitant to put a dog out there that may not be prepared for that type of situation. Yeah, for its coat to be prepared for that type yeah. of situation. And I have a Springer who weighs about 40 pounds. Um, he could probably retrieve a goose, but that's going to be difficult for him. Uh, that's just going to be probably too big for him to retrieve. I use him for duck hunting, but I'm using him in the early season before it gets too cold. Even with a neoprene vest, he just doesn't have the coat uh, that's going to keep him as warm in that cold water. And remember, just when you're in water, it cools you off much faster. So that's going to have an impact on the dog. And I know into the 30s, that's going to be tough on my dog to get out there and get wet and then have to sit for a while and then get wet again. So I don't hunt him in that really cold weather. 
So we're hunting like and, labs, retrievers. Uh, so I've hunted with, uh, I actually, my family owned Boinkin Spaniels and Spaniels for a long time. Um, and they are absolutely fantastic hunting dogs uh, and retrievers in general. Um, Boinkin Spaniels were bred, I think in South Carolina. Yeah for waterfowl hunting specifically uh, in swamps and stuff like that because they're they tend to be a little bit smaller um and when they're you don't want a big if you're in a canoe or a small boat or something like that you got a hundred pound lab in the canoe or the boat or a hundred pound chessy that boat could start rocking a little bit more than it will when there's a you know like you said a 45 40 pound dog in there but but yeah i mean you know your dog's limitations too is something that i would recommend <clears throat> the more you hunt with your dog the more you'll figure out about your dog and the more you'll see what their limitations are and do not push them past those limitations um, because you do never want to see you know something happen i never want to see something happen to my dog you know when he's out hunting and i've seen him get you know two points where i've had to you know pull him out of a situation and bring him to a vehicle when ice is forming around the water and he's done 30 40 retrieves on snow geese one after the other and he's got to come out and i've got to warm him up because he's just either shuts down or starts to get like lethargic and won't you, you'll you'll notice it you'll see signs of that of something going wrong and and i definitely recommend not pushing that dog past its limitations um we are okay i have a few uh i have more really in-depth questions that i want to like pick your brain about but i feel like i should probably ask some of these more basic questions just yeah. in case somebody else yeah. needs clarification um because we are gonna probably run out of time <clears throat> first and i feel like this is a really simple question but i'm going to ask it in case somebody doesn't know if uh you have birds coming in where do i aim do i aim at its head do i aim at its chest where do i aim yeah so <laughs> you want to shoot at where they're going and not where they've been okay if that's the if that's the best way i can answer that so you know ducks and geese you're gonna your lead is going to be a little bit different verse and to the distance that you're shooting them at you know if they're closer your leads a little bit less and you're the more you the more you hunt and the more you shoot at a live moving target the more you'll understand where your lead needs to be and where you need to shoot at um, and it's an always it's very important to to follow through when you shoot because when you may your lead might be perfect and when you pull the trigger and you stop for that split second and you shoot that bird's past where you're aiming at and you're going to miss um so get out there and and shoot clay birds um, there's nothing like the real thing um clay birds is only going to get you so far um but it's definitely something that will help a lot figuring out uh, your left and rights, your you know forwards, backwards, your lead, um, and where to properly aim ahead of that target to to make an an effective shot. I I would also add use the right size shot and shoot the right distances. So. If you're using a, a smaller shot um, and trying to shoot a long way, you're not going to be effective. Um, but if you're using, I like to use BBs when I'm hunting geese. Uh, if I'm shooting in within my range, it will pass through a breast and will kill the bird. But if you're, it, I don't think it's ethical to use small shot and shoot long distances to try to hit the head because you're more likely to just end up wounding something. I would say that there's a little bit of a variation to there depending on the shot you're using. Too. Oh, definitely. Yeah. If you're, use, if you're using bismuth or tungsten or something like that, you definitely have a much more lethal um, 
downrange energy with stuff that's a lot denser than steel is. So like he, you just said that you shoot, are you shooting a 12 gauge? Yeah, 12 so gauge steel. 12 gauge steel BBs. I shoot 20 gauge bismuth fours at big Canada geese all throughout the year at anywhere, you know, I would, within decoying range. I'm not going to take a shot that I'm not, I don't feel confident in. Um, but I would say anywhere within 40 yards, you know, I feel personally, I've, I've patterned my shotgun. I've been hunting for a long time with these birds. I know, you know, where to shoot, where to aim, that kind of stuff. I know my lethal range. Um, so, you know, that's stuff to look up to is, is the different kind of shot that could possibly provide you, um, a little bit more of an opportunity. Um, if you want to go down in shot size, I recommend doing that. Um, if you're going to go down in shot size, underneath probably twos, I would say for geese to start looking into that, you know, yeah. bismuth or tungsten or something like that. Um, that way you can just be a little bit more lethal than steel shot at those distances. Um, so I know the difference, um, but I just want to make sure everybody else knows the difference if they are completely new to um, hunting. Uh, what's the difference between a daily bag limit and possession? Daily bag limit is how many you can shoot in a day. And a possession is how many you can have in the field. So if you, this is often used for like hunting trips. If you go somewhere to hunt, like say if I go out to New Jersey to hunt for three days, uh, and the bag limit, daily bag limits five, your possession limit's going to be 15. It's always, it's three times your daily bag limit. So I can bring 15 geese back in my car. Um, so I could, if I, if I go and limit out every day, I can only have three days worth of, of bag limits that I can bring back. So if I were to go out there for four days and I limit it out, I'm going to have to be eating a lot of geese while I'm out there to bring them back. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that's um, everything. I I do know you uh, mentioned earlier, and I don't know if people know the difference between this or not, or what this is, but you did mention earlier um, about pass shooting and jump shooting. Um, and I don't know if we kind of defined what that was or why you would or would not want to do that, but it might be beneficial. So um, there are legal methods of hunting. Um, you're not using decoys uh, for those methods. Um, I really, you, you need to be careful when doing that, um, especially if you're doing it on public land. I recommend against it on public land personally for just for safety reasons only. Um, you know, if you're walking around public land and you're trying to jump shoot birds, you don't know who's on the other side of the cattails that you might be jumping up birds off of, or you don't know what's around the bend of the river. You know, you don't know if someone's standing around the other side of the river bend that you might be shooting towards. You may have done your research and, you know, you know, there's a house over there, you know, there's not a house over there. And then you need to make sure you're not shooting into any sort of safety zones um and pass shooting to pass pass shooting's great especially if you can't afford deco if you can't afford decoys it's a it's a an opportunity to let you go out there and still enjoy the sport now um something i would touch on too with jump shooting is to know your rules and regs with jump shooting you can't just see geese on the side of the road get out and load your gun and shoot those geese like you have to be away you have to be away from your vehicle you need to walk to those birds and you need to be far enough away from any safety zone and not be shooting into that safety zone either so that's something that you need to make sure of on your rules and regulations especially anywhere you go one but two you can look on our pgc website and um you know or um 
call us or call a game warden in your area um, to try and get a more specific um, kind of look on that as well. But um, pass shooting is essentially just you're shooting at geese passing by. Um, and something I will stress that we talked about just now recently and before is knowing the lethal range of your shotgun. Um, pass shooting, you have a much higher percentage that you may not have as open of a shot at the vitals as you would if you're decoying birds at close range. Um, so you need to make sure that your your gun has been patterned and that you know the limits that you can that you can shoot um and like i said just both of those things are are something you need to be so safe with and you need to make sure you know your your eyes are dotted and your t's are crossed especially when you're hunting on public land um private land it's a little bit um more relaxed with it because you can kind of um you you usually know what's around what is there what isn't there or what should or shouldn't be there um so that kind of gives you um the ability to know that but um pass shooting and jump shooting are our legal methods um and again i don't recommend them personally on public land uh, you can do them People are very successful with it. People have a great time with it. It's something that you can do um, if you don't have or can't purchase decoys. Um, it's an easy way to get into the sport, but um, to really just, you know, as a personal preference, I'd prefer to decoy geese over um, pass shooting them or jump shooting them. But, you know, it's kind of personal preference, really. Okay, cool. Um, that is all the questions we have, and we don't have anything else that came in. Okay, um, so to be respectful of everyone's time, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, once again, if we didn't get your question, we will follow up with you, or didn't get to it, we'll follow up uh, with you via email afterwards. Um, if you have questions uh, that you think about later, you can always email us at mentoredhunting at pa.gov, um, and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, everyone will receive a follow-up email with more information and resources as well. Um, there's that goose cleaning video that we will also share um, with everybody as well. Um, and I would like to thank Ken and John for sharing uh, their knowledge and experience with us today. And we hope you enjoyed it and we'll tune in for the next Learn to Hunt program, which will be on ducks later this fall. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and have a great day.